Hey, Rachel here at Pink Puddle Studio and welcome back to part two of getting started with watercolor. So if you missed part one, go on back. Today's video is gonna be about making your kit and also talking about your space. And when I say space, I mean your creative space. Where are you gonna paint? That's a really, really important part of this process. So we're gonna talk all about that. And I think you're gonna be pleasantly surprised about how attainable this creative practice really is. So let's get started. Number one, watercolor brushes. It's nice to have a range of brushes. Round brushes are the most versatile, so having several different sizes is great. Also, you can see on the side here, you can find the size number. I suggest a number three, a number eight, and a number 12 for a round brush, and anything larger, maybe a number 26. Flat brushes are great for filling backgrounds, washes, and anything angular. I don't use these as often, but I do suggest a number 12 and a one inch for large painting. Another great brush to have is a half inch oval brush. It's great for long strokes with that rounded top edge. It's beautiful for botanicals. Number two for your kit, you need paper. So you can't just pull out any old copy paper from your printer and start using it when you watercolor. It's just not gonna work. You need something heftier that's made for watercolor. So there are three types of watercolor paper. The most common one used is the cold press paper, and that's the one I use all the time. It has a little bit of a toothy texture to it, and I like it because of that. And I, use, I have like a looser style, so it works. Hot press paper is another type, and that's a smoother paper. There's no texture to it. So those types of papers are good for, I would say, fine detail work so that you can really, really get in there and see all the details. And I notice a lot of people use it when they paint like glass or reflective surfaces, things like that. And then you have your rough paper, which I never use that one as well because it's a little bit too textured for me. But if you like texture, it's good to try this. And if you haven't tried any of these papers before, I suggest that you try all three just to see if you like one over the other and you'll have a paper of preference, I'm sure, as you create your style. So watercolor paper also comes in weight, just like copy paper or anything like that. I suggest that you stay in the range between 140 and 300 pound paper, only because it can withstand the water better and 140 is, is a thinner paper, but not super thin. And then 300 is like, you can't even bend that. So again, maybe try both and see which one you like or which one works best for your practice. As far as brands go, there's so many, right? I suggest Legion Stonehenge Aqua. It comes in a cold press or a hot press. There's Strathmore Vision, which I use daily because I use a lot of paper and I go through a lot of paper. And then there's Fabriana Studio and they do a cold press and hot press and they have really nice paper. It's an Italian type paper. And then there's arches. I'm sure most people who don't even watercolor know arches. It's um, a very high-end paper. It's very nice. I rarely use it because I go through so much paper. I think when I'm doing like one large piece, maybe I invest in like a bigger size. They have a rough one as well. So they do hot press, cold press, and rough. And as far as sizes go, I like to have a range. So I suggest you have say like a five by seven size and six by nine, um, an eight by 10, or sometimes it comes in a nine by 12, and then an 11 by 14. And if you wanna paint a lot larger than that, you can try an 18 by 24. Number three is your paint. There are so many beginner painting palettes out there and paints. And um, let me tell you, a lot of them are no good. I have tested them and they're so bad. Um, there's some good ones though, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about. But the problem with a lot of the ones that you may have experienced, the chalkiness after it dries, there's like a film of chalk on the top and it's like, Ugh. and then also they're very underpigmented. They don't put any color into them and there's no depth. So yeah, no good. But I'm gonna help you choose the right one. I would say choosing a pre-made palette is probably the least amount of stress starting out. If you're not sure if you wanna even do this, um, I would suggest getting a pre-made palette. And what I mean by that is that it's like a palette set and there's like 12 little half pans in there. 
You can be adventurous and do tubes, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. So back to pre-made palettes. I'll tell you the ones that I suggest. So Art Philosophy Prima, they have some beautiful palettes. I like these because they're very pigmented, and also they have more of like the basic palette, but then they also have specialty palettes. And what I mean by that is that they're catered towards different, I wanna say atmospheres. Like they have tropical ones that are more that color palette or woodland, um, different ones. So they're really fun. Number two, I would say Sakura Koi palette. This is a great starter palette. Actually was my first palette starting out and um, I took it from my sister. Uh, so it really wasn't mine, but I'd say it was a good palette. So a good starter palette. Number three is Windsor Newton Cotman. You probably have heard of Windsor and Newton, and so they have a Cotman brand, which is considered their student grade, which I use. They're great, they're great paint, and you can get it in sets of like 12 and 24. You can find them pretty much anywhere online. If you wanna go with tubed colors, you're being more brave here. I would suggest getting the primary and secondary colors. So your red, blue, and yellow, and then your green, orange, and purple. So that way you have a variety. And it's not so many to start with that you get overwhelmed. If you've been following me, you know I love Turner Design Gouache. I love, love, love. The pigments are so beautiful. I use the Windsor and Newton Cotman tubed ones as well. They have some really beautiful greens that I use and some blues. So that's a great brand. And then lately I've been getting into the Holven watercolors as well. They have a, some unique colors in there. Whatever you choose to do, if you choose to go with a pre-made palette or tubed colors, then I suggest always still having a mixing palette. So that's number four. Your mixing palette can be a disposable palette, something that you can get these sheets, like this is from Jerry's Artorama, and you can reuse these sheets or you can throw them away. Or another option is a palette with wells. I like this palette because I can use the middle section for mixing, but also I can put all my colors around the outside and it has a lid to help things stay moist. Number three for this option is you can thrift a palette. And what I mean by that is you can use a ceramic plate or a platter to mix your colors. So you can go in many directions for mixing. It just depends on what fits your style the best. Number five is your water cup. I like to use clear jars so that I can see the color, but also I like to use like spaghetti jars. I don't have to buy anything, so it's just pickle jars, spaghetti jar, anything that has a glass jar that has, I would say that has like a nice, at least like three inches to the width of the top. Um, that way you can put multiple brushes in there nicely. I like to use two of them at a time. I use one for darks and then I use one for lights. That way I don't mix the colors and they get all muddy and stuff. So that's just a painter's tip for you guys. Okay, number six is a paper towel. Paper towel isn't just to set your watercolor brush on, but it is used for that. It is a tool in watercolor. It's very important because you use it to lift out water or pigment from your painting. You can use little corners of it. It's just to lighten it if you put too much on or sometimes you layer colors and you want something really, really light, so you need to pat it out. Paper towel is perfect for that. So I suggest that. I've tried to use rags before to be more green, but they don't lift the color out very well. So I was thinking one thing that could be maybe a good alternative to paper towel would be a Swedish dishcloth. So that could be a good thing to try. Okay, now that we've gone through our kit, let's talk about our space our creative space. Where are we gonna paint? That's just as important as your materials, let me tell you, because if you don't feel inspired, you're not gonna paint. Now, let's think about these things. Where do you have the best lighting? Where do you feel most inspired? Where do you have a space where you can be left to your creativity? Think of all these three things in conjunction with one another, and it'll help you decide where your best space is. So just think a minute. Let me give you a few ideas if you're stumped. A den with a window, a covered patio, back patio, so maybe you're not as distracted. A guest room that's not utilized every day. Maybe your own room, like a corner. A living room corner, uh, maybe a dining room nook. 
There's a lot of different options and I hope you can find one that suits you best. I'm really excited to see your kits come together and you know, I'm really excited to see your creative space. So make sure that you tag me on your creative journey at Pink Puddle Studio. And in part three, we're gonna be talking about deciding what to paint. What's next, right? How, what do we paint? Well, we'll talk about all that later. So I hope you can join me and I'll see you then. Bye.